This is Nick Black and today I'm in the Beverly Hills office of Paul Mazursky and Paul, thanks very much for taking time to talk with us. My pleasure. I always wanted to do, know about kangaroos and koala bears and all that stuff that you guys talk about, Aborigines, I know. Well, today we're going to talk about you. Let's start at the start, shall we? You were born in New York. Where did this urge to become an actor or to become involved in show business? Well, it actually happened in the bathtub in Brooklyn when I was a kid. This is true now. My mother used to take me to the movies a lot. I was the only child, and my mother loved movies. I would actually cut school with her permission and go see double features, and I somehow who knows why, I wanted to be an actor. And I'd lie in the bathtub dreaming of being, you know, Errol Flynn and Humphrey Bogart and all that sort of thing. Then later, my mother actually took me to foreign films, and I got more into it. But I only was interested in acting when I started. Did you follow acting with your mother's encouragement? Well, not, you know, I followed acting. I don't think she encouraged it. I think she was worried. We came from, you know, rather poor, lower middle class people. When I grew up, my father was, uh, you know, really broke. He was what they call the WPA, Works Progress Administration. That's the 30s. I think they were nervous when I said, I want to be an actor. You're going to be out of work half the time. And they were right. So I fooled around a little bit with maybe getting a teaching license. But I was really only interested in acting. And when I went to college, I went to Brooklyn College. I acted in a lot of plays. When I got out, I was lucky enough to get a part in Stanley Kubrick's first picture called Fear and Desire. How did that come about, Paul? The writer, a guy named Howard Sackler, who later wrote The Great White Hope, saw me in a play. I was still going to Brooklyn College, but I did what would be called an off-Broadway play called He Who Gets Slapped by a Russian playwright named Andrea. And he said, called me up and he said, listen, you don't know me, but I saw you in this play. I wrote a movie. Some friend of mine is doing it. Do you want to go read? I said, yeah, sure. I read and the guy turned out to be Kubrick. He didn't know much about acting and he never liked this movie, by the way. It's very hard to see. In fact, that's the only Kubrick movie that the estate has kept to themselves. I had a print of it. I can't find it on video. Someone has borrowed it and stolen it. Eastman Kodak has it in Rochester, New York. But Stanley doesn't like when they show it. He just didn't like it. That's life. It was a very low budget and I think it was independently produced. Did that lead on to other things, Paul? Or how did you establish yourself slowly but surely? Well, the Kubrick picture didn't do it, but a couple of years later, I was working as a uh, short order cook in a health food restaurant in New York when the phone rang and the boss said, it's for you. And it was this guy from MGM calling, saying that the screen test I'd done for Blackboard Jungle, I got the part. So I got into this big MGM movie directed by Richard Brooks with Sidney Poitier. And I was one of the three or four kids brought out from New York. And I think that started me in a serious way. And at that point, I was studying acting with Lee Strasberg and Paul Mann. And I went to California, stayed six weeks, did Blackboard, came back and started to get some work on television playing juvenile delinquents, which I looked like. I was thin, and there's a shot of me in my office. You can see me up there with Louis Calhoun. wish I was that thin now. In any case, after I did that for a couple of years, I got tired of those parts. It was the same thing over and over again. Hey, you know, tough guys. And I started doing a comedy act with a guy from Brooklyn College, you know, graduate. And we were called Igor and H. I was Igor. And we were fairly successful. And one thing led to another, and I eventually finally got more work. And by the end of the 50s, it was now like 1969, 70, things had dried up in television in New York, and I went to California. I saw you in a couple of Twilight Zone episodes, but besides Twilight Zone, in the mid-60s, skipping over a bit, there was a show called The Monkeys. Now, what was your participation in The Monkeys there, Paul? Well, I had a writing partner named Larry Tucker. We later went on to write I Love You, Alice B. Tocos and Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. And we were writing for the Danny Kay show. I had gone from acting to writing for television for Danny Kay, the comedian. And we got a call and went to see some producers, and we ended up writing The Monkeys, the pilot. We created The Monkeys, in other words. But now we're the monkeys. So we were hot as fire. And I was going to direct seven of the first 13, but I got into a terrible argument with the producers about some financial stuff, and that never happened. But that was our connection. We wrote the pilot, and we're in the pilot. We actually are in it. Funny, some funny stuff. Who knew it was going to be a hit? We didn't know. Well, it's lasted till now, and it still gets it played. Is. It's still going on, and we don't get residuals, because at that time, 65, there was no residual arrangement. I've been interviewed five times for documentaries about the monkeys. I'm getting tired of it. Because then you meet the kids, the, you know, the grown monkeys, who are now in their 50s. It's funny. With Larry Tucker, you got together and you wrote I Love You, Alice B. Toklas. Now, first of all, how did you get the idea for that, and how did it get made into a feature film? Because it's a fairly big jump from TV yeah. to film. Well, certain things happen in one's career, in my lifetime, that kind of validate who you are in a way that you can't really explain. In other words, here I was going to Brooklyn College. Somebody saw me in a play, and next thing you know, I was in Hollywood, in California anyway, in this first movie of Kubrick's. It's a bizarre, but it happened. 
And by the same token, years later, we had written for Danny Kaye for four years, and, you know, we were kind of tired of it. And we decided to try to write a movie, and I had this idea about an L.A. lawyer who drops out and becomes a hippie. And hippies at that time in 19, I guess it was 67, it was the rage. We rented an office on Sunset Boulevard, and my hair grew long, and I smoked a joint or two, and all that stuff was going on. And we wrote it, and my agent read it, and a week later, he called me and said, look, Peter Sellers wants to do it. Go meet him. And I met with Sellers, and I was going to direct it, but something happened happened there and it didn't happen but we were the producers as well as the writers and that's where I learned a lot about making movies and what a year of my life it was to go from being a television writer to a Peter Sellers movie he was hot as a pistol then so that's how it happened it's it's that simple in other words your listeners if you write a script miracles can happen much more than with actors producers or anybody else because scripts get read and you can be an unknown you know Quentin Tarantino was working in a video store it happens so it happened with us and we wrote that and the next thing you know we wrote Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice well just to go back to I love you LSB Toklas it's also criticizes the hippie movement too and that would have been a fairly early thing to do because the establishment finally well the Hollywood establishment finally started making hippie type movies didn't they yeah I don't say this I'm not bragging but most of my films caught things that were happening about five years before Hollywood would really caught on, even though I made them for Hollywood. Bob and Carol was the first thing. They didn't want to make it. They were afraid it was too dirty. The first guy who read it from some studio said, this is too dirty. It's two couples switching. And I said, well, what if I get Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward to play one couple? He said, well, then it would be clean. (laughs) So, Toklas, I wasn't criticizing the hippie movement. I was confused. Here I was, right there in the mainstream, and I was starting to dream about, am I going to be writing for Danny Kaye the rest of my life? Why don't I just drop out and go off and become a hippie? And I was very ambivalent about it. And we wrote a movie about it, where this guy drops out, becomes a hippie, but finally they invade his life to a degree where, and I wouldn't say he was a real hippie, but he tried it. Hollywood, yeah, the Hollywood stuff about most things is usually wonderfully superficial. It can be very entertaining, but they rarely go deep, deep, deep. So who knows if they really know what a real hippie is. They've been a couple of things over the years, but not many. And ours was a comedy. It was definitely larger than life. But I liked the movie. I think it was funny. After Alice Toklas, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice was a huge, huge hit. And then next, you came to Alex in Wonderland, which they called the Hollywood's version of Eight and a Half. Did you really have some sort of block at the time, or was this something that you'd planned always? Well, that's a good question. After you have a big hit in Hollywood, you basically can make a movie about a chicken, and they'll do it. If we had a big hit, Bob and Carol was a monster hit. And I said, we're not sure what we're doing, we're going to do our movie and we want to start shooting an X and Y and Z and we sat down and started to fool around with ideas and everything we did fell apart. We couldn't write. And then one day I said to Larry Tucker let's do a movie about a guy who doesn't know what to do next. And then I said, Jesus, wait a second didn't Fellini just do that? (laughs) That's where I got the idea. I said, well let's have him not only does he not know what to do next and not only is he blocked, but his own dreams he dreams in the styles of other filmmakers he dreams in a Fellini style, he dreams in a Truffaut style, etc. So we made this very personal movie which was a huge flop and definitely contained some of my favorite stuff in movies. But that's show business. And I went from the unbelievable high of Bob and Carol to the unbearable low of the failure. The failure meaning no business, bad reviews. For the most part, after it was out a while and started to play, it became a cult movie. And now it has fans. I get actual a lot of calls. Not a lot, but some. And I got so down from it that I decided to move, to get out of Hollywood. I don't want to live in this ridiculous place. I was always ambivalent, where you're the king on Monday, and a week later you're you know, some moron. So I took my wife and my kids, and we moved to Italy. And I lasted about five months, came back to America, and wrote Harry and Tonto and Bloom in Love and got them both made. And here I was back in America. So it was a great time. I was out of work in Italy, but I was thinking, and I was a sort of a professional, unhappy guy, you know? I was like, oh, am I miserable? Here I am in midst of all this great beauty. Could you speak the language? Uh, Not great. I spoke a little, but I had Fellini, who was a friend of mine. We became fast friends because he was in Alex in Wonderland. And uh, that story is in my book. If you readers are interested, I wrote a book called Show Me the Magic. And Federico and I were very good friends from 69 right on through his death. Very close. So I had him there, and I had Vittorio De Sica's daughter, who was a friend of mine. De Sica was, too. And I had lots of reasons to love Italy, but I was basically... What am I doing here? I didn't know. You know, I was like an alien. I don't know how you felt when you came from Australia to America. But it's even tougher in Italy because it's gorgeous, great coffee, great food, beautiful women, etc. The ruins of this and that. But you don't speak the language. You're an alien. So you start to feel after about a month when the thing wears off, all you're waiting for is the daily English paper to see what's going on. Who won the baseball game? (laughs) 
Now, you mentioned Blooming Love and Harry and Tonta, and after the success of Harry and Tonta, very highly critically acclaimed as well, was Next Stop Greenwich Village. Now, was that strictly autobiographical? Well, Next Stop Greenwich Village, after I wrote Bloomin' Love myself, I wrote Harry and Tonto with a guy named Josh Greenfeld. And when those were finished, I started to fool around with this Next Stop idea, which was basically my story of being a 21-year-old kid who's going to move from his home and his apartment in Brooklyn with his mother and father and move to Greenwich Village. I started to write it, and I had a lot of doubts about it, that it was too personal, because don't forget I'd been killed for Alex in Wonderland. And I showed about a third of the script to Josh Greenfeld, who'd written Harry and Tonto with me, and he said, keep going. And I did. And I made, you know, one of my favorite films. So I must say, it seems to me, now that I'm 70, and at that time I was like 40 or something, it seems that it was easier in those days to make whatever I wanted to make as long as the price was low. And those pictures cost like two million bucks. Harry and Tano cost a million. Today, now you never know whether it's ageism or not. It's very hard to get to make pictures like that unless you do them on high-definition video or something. They don't make too many personal films. They just don't do it. But I made Next Stop, which was not a success in America, but a big success in Europe and a big success in Latin America. Big. I don't know about Australia. Israel was a huge hit. But, you know, I'm glad I made it. Then I did An Unmarried Woman after that, and that was a big hit. So I was sort of turning them out. Big hit, not so good. Big hit. Uh, Up and down, but I was batting like four out of eight. It's pretty good. Pretty good for Hollywood, yeah. And what happened to Larry Tucker? Larry Tucker, after we did Alex in Wonderland, I came back from shooting the Fellini sequence in Rome, and Larry said that he come to this big decision over some weekend and counter therapy and he decided he was going to go on his own and stuff like that and we were you know very good friends and he just wanted to go on his own and he went off he did a lot of writing for television and stuff like that he's a wonderful guy and he was very funny unmarried woman jill clayberg is absolutely astounding in that paul was it her or you or a combination <laughs> well jill was relatively unknown and the great thing about those days i again i say this is i had the power to cast an unknown I made the movie for Fox. The producer was uh, Alan Ladd Jr. It was his company. He was running Fox. I had seen Jill Clayburgh in Gable and Lombard. That's all. And some other TV movie. She was only 34 and a half. I really wanted someone a little older, but it was both of us. It was the script. It was her. It was me. It was the timing. You know, it was the first movie where a woman sort of declared her independence. The movie was turned down by Barbra Streisand, by Jane Fonda. And Jane later apologized. She said, I blew it. I didn't get it. But I saw Jill, met with her, hired her, and that was that. It was a big financial success, wasn't it? It was a big hit. And I actually, I don't like to talk about money to Australians. Because I know how tight you all (laughs) are. I say might you are tight. You know, you'll spill for the Fosters now and then. But my accent is not as good as I'd like it to be. Down, down, easy down. I made actual money. You rarely see profits today. Spielberg does and George Lucas does, but it's hard to see profits because the expense of selling a movie today is enormous. In those days, it wasn't. So I made real money on that movie. Speaking of Australians, how did you come together with Don McAlpine? What a wonderful question, wonderful question. I did Willie and Phil after An Unmarried Woman. Sven Nikvist was the cameraman, and we were then he was going to do Tempest, and he had to go do a Bergman picture, Fanny and Alexander. And I had just by coincidence seen Breaker Moran in the movie theater. Just coincidental. And I was so struck by the, not only did I love the movie, the photography, I called someone who knew Bruce Beresford, checked out this McAlpine fellow, and he said, look, he's a great mate, etc., etc. So I called McAlpine in Australia, talked to him a bit, hard to understand him. I tell you, his accent was brutally thick. He told you, he said, oh, I know you, also, certainly, also, oh, you tempest, I. I said, yeah, Greece, a lot of outdoor, beautiful, blah, blah, blah. So I sent him the script, he sent me a nice letter, I called him back and said, you got the job. I didn't go to see him. I never met him. It's a gamble in a way, but you know, with cinematography, if you've seen their work, and he also did some other wonderful stuff. He did the one with Gillian Armstrong, My Brilliant Career. He was a wonderful camera. He is wonderful. And I met Don for the first time when we arrived in Greece for the location scouting, and I loved him. And it was great. And we did four pictures together. Tempest, Moscow on the Hudson, which I shot in Munich and New York. Moon over Parador, which we did in Brazil, and Down and Out in Beverly Hills, which he did in Beverly Hills, and which I think he should have gotten an Oscar nomination. It's Down and Out, you know, they're all beautifully photographed, but Down and Out is particularly wonderful because it has a satiric edge to it. It's got a gloss and a tone that brilliantly captures the bullshit of Beverly Hills. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So he's good. And then he's going to do Enemies of Love Story, and Don had a hernia and couldn't do it. So it's a hernia that separated us. <laughs> 
I had ended enemies with another cameraman named Fred Murphy. I just want to quickly ask you about the Tempest Paul, two of America's finest actors, Jenna Rollins and, well, he's probably better known as a director, John Cassavetes. Were there a pleasure to direct? Well, Tempest is one of my most ambitious movies, and I say that in the sense of I don't ever think I could get that made now because it's a far-out picture and it's got a lot of fans. And Cassavetes was a cinch. He, he was a, not only a wonderful director, he's a wonderful guy. And he came on like tough guy and all that stuff, Cassavetes, but he was great. We were very good friends by the time that picture finished, and Jenna was wonderful. Raul Julia was in it, Vittorio Gossman, Susan Sarandon, on a very difficult location. Beautiful, but difficult. And a very young Molly Ringwald. And Molly Ringwald was 14 years old. I found her somewhere in L.A. It was a great thrill and hard work. And McAlpine, by the way, fantastic. Quickly want to get on to Moscow on the Hudson starring Robin Williams. Now, how was old Robin? Was he hard to control? Well, you know, my experience in these 30 years of making movies has been almost no trouble with the ones who are supposed to be trouble. Don't forget, down and out, I cast, as I told many people, I cast the picture at the Betty Ford Clinic. I had Nick Nolte. I don't know if you're Australian, they know what the Betty Ford Clinic is, it's a recovery. Rehab. I had Bette Midler, Richard Dreyfus, who had turned over on a car in Beverly Hills on Coke. And Nick Nolte, who, you know, liked to sip the old wine. And no trouble. They were great. And I had no trouble with Robin. Robin was fast, furious, funny, wired, very smart. And I had a little trouble with him in rehearsal because he wanted to do, I thought, shtick shtick meaning a little more than he had to do you know it's about a Russian musician who defects I think I won the argument and we got along great I have a lot of affection for Robin if I could give him some advice it's he should go back to doing a couple of simpler things anyway I want to skip on to scenes from a mall which I happened to see with my wife and we both loved it because we could both identify being long married ourselves Uh Woody Allen doesn't often act for other people he only usually acts for himself how did you get Woody and it was a great pairing well that's a great story because I never dreamt that I would do a movie with Woody Allen because Woody Allen had only been in one picture that he didn't write, The Front, directed by Marty Ritt. But when I finished the script of Scenes from a Mall with Roger Simon, my agent, was a man named Sam Cohen, one of my two agents, Jeff Berg and Sam Cohen, told me, you know, Woody is looking for something. He's got to make money. He was still married to Mia then, but he needed money. I said, well, Woody's not going to do this. You know, and I don't think, me personally, Woody Allen's a great actor. Woody Allen plays Woody Allen, he's great. And I forgot about it. Well, about a week later, I got a call from Michael Eisner, the head of Disney, and Sam Cohen must have talked to him, and Eisner said, look, Woody Allen's looking for a movie. I said, well, you know, I don't think he'll do it, but not only that, I don't know if he's right. What about Kevin Klein? We'll get Kevin Klein and Meryl Streep. And that would have been a more serious, still with humor, but a different movie. Well, he said, let Woody read it. So I gave the script to Sam Cohen, and the next day he called me. Woody read it overnight. said, okay, I'll do it. Now here I was, what do I do? And I flew to New York to meet him, and I liked him. And I did it. And I got bet. And she was nervous as hell about doing it. It's a two-character movie. And they were both great. They're just wonderful. No trouble. Woody Allen's biggest thing was he doesn't like to do a lot of takes. When he's in his own movies, I don't think he covers, which means he doesn't get many close-ups. He just one long take, and that's it. And I cover. So we had a little bit of a, not argument. He would say, well, can't I go home? I did it already. He was fine. All right. Well, we're just about out of time, Paul. I just want to mention The Pickle and Faithful, and also you did for TV Walter Winchell. Was that for the HBOs or one of those? Yeah, HBO. I did Winchell with Stanley Tucci, who's a great actor. He's an actor you should all know about. And he's directed a couple of wonderful movies. Faithful, I had Cher, and she was easy to work with, but a pain in the ass afterwards. (laughs) Afterwards. While you were editing? After it was edited, she wanted to make changes, which I didn't want to do. So we got into a bit of a tiff. And The Pickle is an interesting movie, which I'm thrilled that I got to make. So that's it. HBO, by the way, is great to make movies for because they don't have commercials. It's on cable, but it's like making a movie. It's not like doing a television. The problem with TV for me is that you'll do an hour show and there'll be 18 minutes of commercials. It's impossible to follow something. Anyway, that's life. What are you up to now at the moment, Paul? I'm trying to get a movie made in Italy. So that's one of the things I'm doing. And then I'm working on a script about Iron Eyes Cody, the old Indian actor, uh, for Showtime. So I've got those two things going. I'm acting a lot, and I'm hoping that maybe when we finish this, you'll give me the money to make the Italian movie. (laughs)